Hi, I'm Drew, also known as Vespers. I run Warp Academy, which is an online collective that trains music producers, and I'm an audio engineer. Through my work, I've gotten pretty deep into the world of music studio and control room design, acoustics, and the specialized types of speakers and headphones that are required for professional monitoring. Over these next few videos, I'm going to summarize some of the most essential things that you'll need to know to be able to level up your studio and monitoring system. When you're recording, producing, engineering, or critically listening to music, there's a need to be able to hear what's going on with transparency and accuracy, true unaltered sound. There's a distinction between professional and recreational listening here. Professionals like audio engineers and music producers need to be able to critically listen to music and make objective decisions about the song. Things like what type of mic to use to capture a vocal performance, whether a particular recording take is good enough, what type of kick drum sample to use, how wide to make the background vocals, what type of reverb treatment to put on a lead synth, that kind of thing. Collectively, these decisions can make or break the commercial success of a song, so it's important to get them right. According to the research, the preferred acoustic performance of professional monitoring systems is significantly different than that of recreational listeners. In general, professional studios and monitoring systems need to be a big step ahead of the consumer playback systems on which the material will ultimately be listened to by end users. Now here's the problem. The speakers and the room they're in form a system, both influencing the sound you hear as the listener. In an ideal situation, you'd be able to hear the music unaltered without any added color from the speaker room system. Otherwise, your judgment of the music might be compromised. There's a lot of variation in the acoustic performance of different makes and models of speakers, even in the world of professional studio monitors that are supposed to have flat frequency responses. When you put speakers into a room, the response of that system is heavily colored by the acoustics of that room. In some listening environments, like small, untreated rooms in residential homes, the final perceived sound can be more influenced by the room than the speakers themselves. For more info on that, check out our video on the basics of room acoustics. In this animation of sound wave propagation in a room, you can see how the sound reflects off of room boundaries and bounces around inside of the listening space. In this situation, you're hearing a large proportion of reflected sounds from the room boundaries, plus any furniture and equipment inside the room, all of which will blur and alter your perception of the direct sound from the speakers. You're hearing the room's sound superimposed on the speaker's direct sound. What's more, the acoustics of large versus small rooms and acoustically treated versus untreated reflective rooms are all substantially different. Let's use a small residential home studio as an example. Here's what the frequency response of this speaker-room combination could look like at the listening position. If you were to mix a song in this environment, you'd likely EQ the bass like this, but you'd be chasing ghosts because none of these issues actually exist in the source music. They only exist as acoustical coloration due to this particular speaker-room combination at this particular listening position. What's more is if you move to a different spot in the room, the response of the speaker room system would change. Even without room acoustics in the equation, there's a significant amount of variation just between different speakers. Even speakers of the same brand and model can sound quite different from each other due to manufacturing tolerances in the speaker components. With a pair of speakers, the frequency response can vary from the left to the right in a matched pair. This is called channel imbalance. And what this can do is smear your perception of phantom center, stereo field, and affect your panning decisions. Due to psychoacoustics, the human brain won't perceive some of these issues. In other words, your ears can lie to you. But a correctly calibrated microphone and measurement system can't be fooled, and that's why we measure. The data doesn't lie. Hopefully it should be somewhat apparent by now why this is all so important. Much of it comes down to translation. When you've put your heart and soul into your mix and it's sounding great in your studio, you want to know with confidence that it's also going to sound great in other listening environments, such as your car, a club, maybe the studio of the record producer who's deciding whether or not they're going to approve your mix, or perhaps you've sent your song into a record label and the A&R is listening to it there, deciding if they're going to sign your track. It needs to sound good on all of those systems, and that's translation. You need to know that you can trust what you're hearing so that you know that the way you're crafting your music is on point and you're not chasing ghosts that only exist in your listening environment. In the past, people have tried to ensure translation by rendering out test mixes and listening to them in the car, on home stereos, on Bluetooth speakers, on PAs, or any other relevant destination systems. But the problem with that is it's so time consuming that it's hardly a professional solution. Room and speaker calibration is a much better and more robust solution. Rooms designed for recreational listening like a living room or movie theater will have multiple people sitting in different locations. In contrast, a music studio 
has a smaller sweet spot where everything's optimized for the position of the engineer and maybe an artist or producer that's sitting alongside them. By using a special measurement microphone and our software, you can take a series of quick and easy acoustic measurements around your listening position. The software then uses these snapshots to construct a frequency response curve unique to your speakers, room, and listening position. Precise digital EQ can then be used to address many of the frequency response issues with your system, including deviations in performance between the left and right speakers in a stereo pair. This shows as a correction curve. In Sound ID Reference, you have a lot of control over what you end up hearing, including the ability to use a target curve. A target curve, also known as a house curve, is simply the desired frequency response for your system after calibration. Some users, for example, prefer more bass or less high-end, and you can dial this into taste. Another advantage of the configurable target curve is due to equal loudness contours. Without getting too into the weeds here because it's a deep topic, the human ear doesn't have a linear sensitivity to different frequencies. So when you're talking about bass, the ear is much less sensitive to bass and somewhat less sensitive to treble than it is to mid-range frequencies. And it also varies with sound pressure level. So when you're listening quietly, you'll need much more bass and somewhat more treble to sound balanced spectrally. As sound pressure levels increase, the perception of bass, mid, and treble, as well as the amount of each that you need to sound balanced, changes. So having the ability to change the target curve of your system is essential if you plan to monitor at different sound pressure levels and you're aiming to achieve a balanced perception of the frequency spectrum. If you're listening at low sound pressure levels, and this might be prudent for long mixing sessions to avoid ear fatigue, then you may want to add more bass to your target curve in the software. Sound ID Reference gives you a lot of powerful ways to tailor the final perceived sound to your liking. For example, you could restrict the frequency range of the correction to target a particular region. This might be useful because every room has what's called a transition frequency, aka the Schroeder frequency, below which the response of the room tends to get quite lumpy with large variations due to the widely spaced out independently operating room modes. So to apply this frequency-based correction, you may choose to restrict the correction curve to just the bass range to be able to smooth out some of the modal behavior below that transition frequency. It's also possible to customize the corrective EQ boosts and restrict the boosts to a certain decibel level or eliminate them entirely. This can be really useful if the boosts from the correction curve are consuming too much headroom, or if the boosts are attempting to correct for boundary nulling from the room rather than an issue with the frequency response of the speakers themselves. This is known as SBIR, or speaker boundary interference response. Boundary nulling, such as that caused by direct reflections from the boundaries close to the speaker causing destructive interference with the direct sound, can't be fixed by EQ. If you boost the monitor drive signal, you simply boost the offending frequency and the reflected energy, and you still get a null. You can choose between various filter types for the EQ correction, including real-time zero latency, mixed phase, or linear phase. Finally, you can blend the correction and the unaffected signal to your liking using a wet-dry control. There's even a new virtual monitoring add-on available separately that allows you to hear how your music will sound for your listeners, this enables you to acoustically teleport yourself into these spaces and do a translation check to see how things sound in cars, laptops, phones, or TVs. Or you can simulate professional studios and simulate near-field, mid-field, and far-field listening experiences on various types of reference monitors. Because you can do all of this without leaving your studio, you can now work fast and confidently like a pro. One caveat that I want to mention is that room correction in Sound ID Reference is best applied once you've already gone through all of the acoustics best practices to set up your room and speakers the best way possible. So we're going to go into some of those in subsequent videos, so make sure you stay tuned for those. But make sure you do not skip over important steps like orienting your room in the correct way, setting up your speakers and listening position using the best practices involving symmetry and an equilateral triangle, Make sure you're doing steps like decoupling your monitor speakers from whatever surface they're on, making sure that your desk is not positioned in such a way that you're getting a reflection that might cause comb filtering, and that you've done your absolute best within your budget and means to be able to acoustically treat your room, damp your room modes. That is gonna make everything downstream of that so much better. And then once all of that stuff is complete, then you can apply the correction from Sound ID Reference as a final layer to take your results to the next level. All right, that's a wrap for this video. I'll catch you on the next one.